So uh, I will try to keep this interactive uh, to the matter and see, talk about two things. Why and how of running a self-managed um, uh, Kubernetes environment. And on top of it, of course, Apache Airflow. This is Apache Airflow talk, right? Okay, and there's the Apache Airflow open source summit. So raise your hand if you are running a self-managed Apache Airflow environment today, either yourself or somebody. Wow, that's huge. Awesome. Raise your hand if you're not using Kubernetes as an underlying orchestration platform among them. Fantastic. Okay, I can trust you, you are in the right session because in this session we're going to talk about all the concepts of why you should be thinking of running on top of Kubernetes and how you can do that. And now uh, she gave a great uh, introduction. I could beat that, so I'm going to skip my presentation. But in a nutshell, what I do is I help out customers. Uh, since I work for Amazon Web Services, I help out customers, particularly in the analytics, containers, and serverless space at our AWS services. And my special focus is Amazon Managed Workflow for Apache Airflow, which is a managed airflow service on AWS. But I've been told to not mention it even once, okay, except my introduction. Uh, so I'll try to do that and make it more interactive. So for the next 20 minutes, we will talk about a few things. One, if you're looking to deploy an Apache Airflow instance today, what are your deployment options? Then, come back to the original question. Why you should be looking at deploying a self-managed Apache Airflow instance? Next, how? How we can go ahead and deploy using, uh, uh, using Kubernetes and its 10,000 additional services that Kubernetes offers? We'll talk about the developer and operator experience, and we'll talk about what you need to be aware of as you're going ahead and deploying a self-managed Apache Airflow instance. And anything that is excluded from this discussion, probably you can ask me questions if we do end up having time at the end of course, right? So let's get started with this packed agenda. So when we're thinking of deploying Apache Airflow, probably I see them into four categorized buckets. First and foremost, of course, you're probably deploying on an on-premise environment. Maybe you have some uh, bare metal servers. Maybe you have uh, virtual machines deployed in your on-premises environments. You need to develop that asset, right? So for that, you might be using your own personal computers, laptops, desktops, and even Chromebooks, okay? Because the previous talk talked about uh, generating a DAC from a large language model, which doesn't require a high uh, volume computer, it only requires a browser to do it, right? If you're looking for cloud-based solutions, or if you're deploying on top of, of the cloud, these are the three options that the premier three cloud providers provide you with. And if you look at that, all of these, Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud Platform, probably give you three variants. The first variant being, you can deploy on virtual machines that each of these cloud providers have. Next, you can deploy on top of a managed community service that each of these cloud providers have. And if you're at all not satisfied with either of these two, probably look at a managed service offering of Apache Airflow that all of these cloud providers have. But let's say you are one of those persons that I do not need a end-to-end -end cloud service. I just need a hosted managed Apache Airflow instance. Why do I do? There's a solution to that too. Our partners and this event co-sponsors, Astronomer has an Astro distribution platform which you can definitely look at. Or you can look at QBall's managed data analytics or data lake services, which only provides a managed Apache Airflow instance. So if you look at this ecosystem, there are two categories in there. One is self-managed, where you are deploying everything on your own. The other is a managed service offering with many di differentiating capabilities, which we're going to discuss next. But for the sake of our talks, I'm going to consider that any where that you deploy, any server that you choose, any platform that you deploy in, or any of these variants that you deploy in, on the left-hand side is a self-managed instance versus the managed service offerings, which are either Amazon Managed Workflow Apache Airflow, if you're running on AWS, Azure Data Factory on Azure, Google Cloud Composer, Astronomers Astro, or Qo. For the sake of this talk today, I'm going to only discuss about deploying Apache Airflow with Kubernetes as an orchestrator. Now, the biggest question is, why should you do that? Before we go into that realm, 
Let's talk, understand the advantages that all of these managed service providers give you with. These are, one, it helps you with very easy setup. You don't have to know anything about Apache Arrow. You just click a button, execute a command line, and the whole endurance Apache Arrow is deployed. It gives you scaling, and it gives you high availability of all the underlying Apache Airflow components. The other three sets of differentiating factors are, it comes with default security, it has encryption at rest, it has encryption in transit, it gives you maintenance and updates option with in-place update options too. If you are looking to move from a lower version of Apache Airflow to a higher version because of all the differentiating or all the different capabilities and new version brought in. But yet, you might still be willing to go ahead and deploy your own version of Apache Airflow, a self-managed option. And why would that be? And for that, I kind of segregate them into different buckets. And the first one of them being the ability to have deployed things with flexibility and choices. What it means is that, let's say you are running an older version of Apache Airflow, which is not supported by any of these providers. Or you might be wanting to fork the open source code because it is open source. You can fork it, make changes to it, and go deploy it. The next differentiating factor might be feature gaps. Many of these managed service providers give you kind of abstraction over the core Apache Airflow components, and that may not best fit to your own sets of needs. The third category might be that you are not willing to go ahead and you know, sign agreements, uh, get into that pay-as-you-go use billing model, or maybe you are still running on on-premises environments, which makes it very difficult to have an on have a managed service deployed on top of. The fourth category there is you might be safe, trying to save on infrastructure costs. Maybe you have ideal servers available on which you can go deploy Apache Airflow in, or you want to go ahead and you know destroy the environment as you need, pause it, freeze it as you need based on your variable demand. Maybe during when during Christmas time when nobody is working, probably shut down the whole environment and then spin it up again after probably 7th of in the next year, because I still need 7 days to read up from all the Christmas plus. Anyways, coming back to the point, you might be still be require, requiring additional security compliance needs. Let's say you are uh, your infrastructure team, your CISO is very adamant that every piece of it needs to be vetted by his team, right? Or maybe a certain set of compliance may not be provided by the managed service offerings that you have. So, these are probably a small list of bucketed features for the reasons why we see most of our users or customers adapt a self-managed environment. I'm sure that I'm going to mess up a few other criteria or uh, opinions there, but more or less, you might be able to fit in all those into one of these six categories. Now that we have identified that you need a self-managed Apache Airflow environment, how do you go ahead and deploy it? So the next step is about this. So if you look at the self-installation of Apache Airflow environment, you kind of have four different variants. The first one is you can download the code, the open source Apache Airflow code, build it, and go deploy it on any server that you want. Next, you want to you can, you, if you're not willing to go build the whole code in Japan, you might be willing to just use it as a pip install on an existing infrastructure that you have. Thirdly, Docker images and Docker composer support, by which you can go ahead and use, download the open source Docker, uh, Docker images that Apache Airflow has and deploy it as well. And finally, the highlight of our talk is using Kubernetes. If you didn't know, uh, Kubernetes has an option called Helm Chats, which stands for which stands for uh, the package, which is the package manager for Kubernetes. And you can use the Helm charts to go ahead and deploy Apache Airflow on top of it. If you look all the way at the bottom, there are relative complexities to which how, what it requires to go ahead and deploy an Apache open source Apache Airflow environment. And I rank it from the most complex or the hardest to the least. With all the Kubernetes uh, Helm charts and other artifacts that Kubernetes provides you with. It probably gives you the easiest way to go ahead and, and deploy or install an open source Apache Airflow environment. Now, not only these, Kubernetes is open source, so it's a managed made in heaven. For two 
open source communities, Kubernetes and Apache Airflow to be installed and working together. Kubernetes, as I said, has a rich ecosystem and it's a faster time to market because it is portable. You can deploy your own in own Apache Airflow instance, package it and deploy it into a server as well. And that gives the highest time ratio or most, most agility. I'm skipping all the other advantages that Kubernetes gives. It includes secrets and configuration management, self-healing features, deployment, service discovery, etc. 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 So you in, you now know why you should be deploying on top of Kubernetes. You now know that you have to go deploy on Kubernetes. Let me walk you through as to what the installation step looks like. Now I'm going to use AWS as a reference here, but note that you get Generalize this to your own servers, own environments as well. The components might be called differently, but essentially their functionality would remain the same. First and foremost, you need to know your environment, be it a virtual server, be it a bare metal server, be it a VDI, whatsoever. You have to identify that where should you install it. Once you've identified that, you start off by creating your cluster. And for creating your EKS cluster, unless you already have one, you need something called a deployment specification file. You can use Quebec to do that matter. If you're using Amazon, then you can look for EKS Cuttle, which is a CLI tool for quick generation and creation of clusters on AWS. Once you have defined the deployment specification file, which defines all the configurations, next you will go ahead and create your cluster, uh, Kubernetes cluster. And I would also recommend that you also update this Kubernetes cluster with something called the cluster autoscaler so that it can do vertical scaling based on your variable demands. So this is just the base Kubernetes cluster. You do need additional components. You need the metadata base and you need a file system which is going to mount it or connect it to your actual EKS cluster so that you can share the tags and the configuration files. And this is these are three important segments and classifications, or I should say segments and components that any Apache Airflow cluster would definitely need. Finally, you would push uh, your Apache Airflow image to a container registry. In this case, I use Amazon Elastic Container Registry, and then use the Helm charts to go ahead and deploy Apache Airflow on top of it. But do not, one of the things that you should always consider is Configuring, configuring that cluster with something called a horizontal pod autoscaler. If you are from the Kubernetes world, you might already know, but let me simplify this, what it means. So remember, the workers can autoscale. The schedulers, you might want to autoscale too. So you need a mechanism by which you can autoscale different components within your Apache Airflow cluster. And that's why you have the horizontal, horizontal pod autoscaler to scale up and down based on how much load you have on that Apache Airflow environment. Finally, your users get access to the UI. But no, this is pure direct access to the Apache Airflow UI. You still have to configure additional authentication and authorization systems to be able to, you, the, to, able to, uh, to, be able to have that user access that Apache Airflow environment. Now, this might mean if you're using an existing authentication authorization system like Active Directory, like Okta, or any other third party systems, definitely you can go configure this at step five for the users to authenticate themselves, authorize to an Airflow role, get access to Airflow, and all the undifferentiated heaven that thing of having to manage those users when they get onboarded, when they're onboarded, etc. So, you have created the EKS cluster. It's up and running, but you need to maintain it. And there are two different viewpoints in there. The first viewpoint is, let's say you are one of those administrators who are responsible for maintaining the environment. And then the other profile is, you are one of those that are developing that and deploying it on a daily basis. So I kind of highlight that as a developer and an operator experience. So what does it look like? Again, I generalize this based on AWS, but please extrapolate that to your own sets of environments or own sets of needs. First and foremost, in that same environment, probably you are segregating three different things. One, your CI-CD pipeline. And when I say CI-CD pipeline, 
it means the pipeline could go ahead and update your Apache Airflow images or CI CD pipeline to go deploy your Airflow Dash too. So these are pipelines for anything, any changes that happen on your existing environments. Primarily, of course, it's a best idea to have segregated environments, you know, so don't deploy them with production or production with dev, okay, because that's usually a problem. Yeah, I've seen customers even do that without realizing I would deploy something on the production environment without realizing it's production. Okay, just, be, uh, just because of a simple uh, typo in that. Anyway, having segregated out those environments, you are probably uploading, whenever you update, want to update the Apache Airflow image, maybe a new Python dependency, maybe a newer version, the patch dependency, etc. You are probably uploading that to your own source control repositories. And then, you can use Argo CD, which is, again, another tool in the Kubernetes ecosystem to go deploy those configurations to your Apache Airflow environment. So what Argo CD is, is Argo CD stands for declarative GitOps using Kubernetes on a Kubernetes cluster. So what Argo CD can do is, it can go and watch files in a source control repository where you maintain all these configurations. For example, let's say if you're running 2.4.3 today, tomorrow you're going to run 2.6.2, then you just update that GitOps, you just update the uh, GitHub <coughs> configuration file to say 2.6.2. Argo CD is intelligent enough to go understand that this change has happened and automatically update your Apache Airflow cluster. And, and I would highly recommend for you to go ahead and put in something, a uh, human intervention and loop, uh, Google process. Otherwise, any company can hide it and go ahead and update the environment without you knowing. So that's one of the uh, guardrails that you can have in place to update the environment. So this takes care of the environmental update. But, but look, what about the code deployment, the tax deployment? For that, you can use Helm charts as well. And you can go ahead and install something called a Git Sync Sidecar. And what sidecars are is a co-deployment of a, another component with the same cluster where your Apache Airflow has, has been deployed in. And what you end up doing in that is it continuously looks for source control repositories. It might be Git, it might be a Bitbucket, it might be something else, and syncs up your DAG environments from that source control repository. So essentially what you can do here is create two separate set of branches, dev and production. And in your dev branch, you can upload all your dev files for your dev deployment. Once every testing has happened, and do test your devs before you deploy them to production. And then you can push them through a GitOps, uh, GitOps action over to your main branch through a merge request, pull request, etc. And then have that another set of uh, GitHub uh, actions go deploy the changes of your tags to a production cluster. So here, through a consolidated environment, you are managing both the underlying infrastructure and as well as your day-to-day -day tag updates. Now, the admin is still not satisfied. He still says, okay, I understand. Fantastic, you're doing everything on a day-to-day -day basis. But how do I know that what's the underlying environment's health look like, right? Yes, Airflow provides a lot of matrices, etc. but I don't know Airflow. I just manage a Kubernetes cluster. And this is a very common problem that the admins are not very familiar with the Apache Airflow or the software piece of it. They understand infrastructure. Now, if you look at a typical Apache Airflow installation, there are four components, a web server, a scheduler, and a worker. And what you can do is, you can push the code, push the metrics using stats T, and then you can use Prometheus and Grafna for observability. And for the end-to-end, -end, both Argo CD and Helm charts can help do that. And if you didn't know what Prometheus is, it's open source monitoring solution, and Grafna is an open source observability platform. Again, everything is open source. Okay, so now that you have done this and operating it on a day-to-day -day basis, what do you have to worry about as your own responsibility? Again, if you have not got the memo yet, you have to know Apache Airflow, you have to know uh, Kubernetes, you have to know networking. You have to also worry about authentication, authorization, 
of grades. You have to worry about high availability, observability, logging, etc. And if you have to do all of this on your own to get the benefits of running a custom Apache Airflow solution based on your own sets of requirements. So, what are the key takeaways? First and foremost, when you are starting off with exploring, do you still need a self-managed Apache Airflow environment? Start off with asking this question. What are my top most priorities? What are my key requirements? How do they stack up? Understand or talk to any of the managed service providers. By the way, all of them have booths in the hallway. Go talk to them uh, if you have those requirements already listed up. If you feel like, yes, I still need to go ahead and manage because you fall into this one of those six buckets we talked about earlier, understand who is going to do what and what are the options you have to go deploy. And by the way, if you didn't fall asleep, the how and the why is something I already just discussed in the last few slides. And finally, deploy this at scale. Reuse existing stuff. Please don't reinvent the wheel. Do take some time to research. It will save you a lot of time, money, and pain of debugging. Okay, and that will give you a way to deploy a self-managed Apache Airflow on, on top of Kubernetes. With that, I have a quick session survey. Promise it's less than five questions. It takes less than two minutes to go answer them. So if you can take a minute to scan this QR code and give me a feedback as to how I did, and it's a way for us to understand what the community and users like you are looking forward and what should we do to make better make it. It will really help out scale and address those concerns per se. With that, let me open up the floor for any questions that you might have, which I don't think we have much time. I think in five minutes or six minutes or so. So actually less. Or actually less. Okay. Cool. Yeah, go ahead, sir. How do you feel about the NATO AES project, can we use that to deploy? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. I mean, again, if, if you remember, it's like I didn't talk of any of the managed service offerings there. You can also, it requires a base new AKS server in that to be a, yes, you can use data on AKS. Yeah, that still works. Okay, that's still, uh, I would say there are things that can be improved on top of it, which will see you can go ahead and self install them. But it is also a good starting point. But you still have to understand what it deploys and how it goes through it. Anybody else? Okay, I see a gentleman out there. Go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, we also uh, self manage the outflow. Uh -huh. uh, we, we don't use Kubernetes, but we do use uh, EFS, which is one component to the yeah. algorithm. Uh, one problem with it is uh, the latency of the FS is, is higher than local disk. Which makes tag parsing time longer, and also some that the, the, the first team uh, uh, read, uh, which take, take out all the bandwidth. Yes. Yeah, I wonder how do we deal with this. And I, I, there are multiple versions of EFS that's available as of today on AWS. Uh, let's talk offline on this topic, understand a bit more, because I need to know what instance type are you using for EFS, how you're scaling it, how you're managing it as well. Okay? But that's a great question. Anybody else? Uh, just a minute or so, unless. Yeah, go ahead. How do you manage deploying over multiple clusters? Okay, the question here is how do you manage deploying uh, uh, Airflow over multiple clusters? If you remember uh, this slide deck in there, if I can quickly go in. Yeah, so this is how you manage it. So if you see, I have one single uh, EK, one single GitHub repository, mm -hmm. I have one single Git Argo or multiple Argo instances that are deployed to multiple, multiple clusters. You are defining the configuration changes differently. So you can have a different branch for dev, different branch for um, production, and you can deploy it to RBC. We have a similar setup, but the problem, okay, the problem is like. But anyway, thank you so much for joining in this talk today. Okay, so have a great learning session in the rest of the patch here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.